as I stand here on stage, you are seeing me. You're noticing what I'm wearing. You're hearing my voice, my intonation, making judgments and, and, uh, and observations of how I look. And you notice I'm wearing glasses. Well, my glasses are, co are correcting my nearsightedness, which is also known as myopia. I was talking to my friend the other day who is an optometrist, and he was sharing with me that there's actually a trend right, going on right now in our world about more and more cases of nearsightedness as a result of all the screen usage that we have in our lives. People spend hours looking at computer monitors or their screens on their phone. In fact, from a recent research study from the World Health Organization, they suggest that more than half of the world population will have some form of nearsightedness by the year 2050. Pretty significant. Now, I'm not here, I'm not an eye expert, and I'm no one to give anyone eye, eye advice or how to be, have more healthy eyes. I was always told to eat more carrots. Anybody? Yeah, that didn't work out very well. But I do want to share with you today a little bit of a metaphor that's related to this nearsightedness. As the world that we live in gets more increasingly close up, as we look at the world through this more, more screens and more close up to us, we may be losing our ability to see altogether. And what I mean by that is the collective nearsightedness that we're developing because of our screen usage is actually preventing us perhaps from, metaphorically speaking, looking up and looking out and seeing the world around us clearly. When I take my glasses off, I can't see you all. I'm, you're very fuzzy and blurry. Just like us, as we continue to look at screens and we're looking at this very closely, just my glasses, we may actually be losing that ability to make connections with the people outside of us. So as I was thinking about this, I was talking to my son, who was doing a research project and they were presenting with his group a debate, and they were debating two sides of a very political topic. As I was talking to him, and he was sharing with me a little bit of his arguments and his setup about how they were going to go about this debate, I recognized that a lot of his sources were coming from news sites or, or blogs or podcasters, which seemed to me a little bit one-sided, a little bit jaded, a little bit kind of slanted towards some of these podcasters and some of these news sites that he was reading. After a long conversation we talked about, I said, you know, to prepare yourself a little bit better, you might want to consider looking and answering questions from the other side of the equation. Look to see if you can see the other point of view from the other team or the other group that you're going to be presenting against and see if you can get that same kind of passion by seeing their point of view. Now, after that advice, taking it for myself, I, was, I made, took some consideration and did an inventory. What I did is I looked at all of the news sites, the media input, what screens was I, what was I looking through, and how much time was I spending looking at these media sites and looking at these screens to form my opinion, to become more informed. I realized that as I was engaging in discussions and dialogue and sometimes debate and sharing my opinion, even strong opinion, that I was sharing thoughts and, and news that I maybe haven't read the whole article. I just read the, the headline, or perhaps I skimmed the article and was summarizing it and creating some grand argument based upon what I skimmed over. Or worse, I was sharing information that I was regurgitating from social media. I realized that perhaps I was losing my ability to see as well. And I was developing another kind of nearsightedness, another kind of myopia. So as I was thinking about this and considering, okay, well, what kind of prescription can I do to help myself see again, to learn to be able to see and train my eyes to when I look out, just like with my glasses, I look out and see you all very clearly, what can I do? And it came down to that, what I discovered that this prescription has three elements, time, intention, and curiosity. So starting off with time, I want to take a little inspiration from the greatest generation, the generation of my grandparents. Now as I was growing up, this generation obviously didn't have the deluge of digital distractions that we have, the constant bombardment, a 24-hour news cycle, but they engaged with the world primarily through the written word and face-to-face -face discourse. As I was visiting them often as a teenager, at one time I quizzed them and I, I noticed that every day 
they would spend hours reading the newspaper, covered like front to back. And I thought, that's really odd. And then at night, they would discuss and watch, and watch the nightly news and have debates over it. Grandma and Grandpa, it sounded like they were fighting. They weren't. They were just discussing the news. I quizzed them on this one time. My grandpa said, I like to stay informed about what's going on. So, well, how do you read the newspaper? I always start with the, the funny pages or the sports section and lose interest after that. I said, no, no, no. I start with the obituaries, make sure I'm not in it. <laughs> and then I continue on reading cover to cover to make sure that I'm current on these issues and the events. Now, what's really cool about them is this is both my grandma and my grandpa. I just felt that they knew a lot of things about lots of different topics. They were able to connect with people. They were able to relate and listen to other people and, and hear them out. And they were good neighbors. They were well connected to the needs and, uh, of what's going on in their community. And they were great citizens. Now, I, see, I think there's something there. Now, I don't think it necessarily was reading the newspaper that developed these traits. But I do think it's the amount of time that they took to invest in being informed to stop and to read the whole story, not skim over it, read the whole story. In fact, they would subscribe to two couple different newspapers contrasting views just to be able to get the whole picture. And because of that, they were able to know and be able to be educated about how to engage and about how to serve their community or where, where, what was needed and how to, how, what, what areas could they possibly share or contribute and form their own opinions. Now, in this increasingly time-compressed world that we live in today, we seem to be willing participants and consumers of the time crunch news, meaning we just listen to the sound bites, or the tell me what I need to know news uh, briefs that you get in your email, or worse, we, we lean on in influencers and podcasters to tell us what we need to know about the news. The danger there is we may be missing the rest of the story. We're looking through the world of their lenses and their screens, and yet we're not looking up and looking out and making our own opinion. And we may be missing opportunities to connect. We may be missing opportunities to help and serve because we don't see them at all. So I would recommend as we think about this, developing your sight is take the time. Ask yourself, how much time am I developing my opinions, my being to stay informed, to see what's in front of me? Now, the second element is about being intentional. And what I mean by intentional is about intentionally connecting to other people. Now, let's think about this for a second. During the pandemic, what happened? We all shut down. We all went into our houses and shut down and basically shut the doors. And nothing was coming in unless we invited it. Now, the problem with that is our world became much more two-dimensional. Screens again. And from that two-dimensional relationships, we started losing context. And so we started forgetting how to, to, to uh, connect in this three-dimensional world. So the doors are open again at the last couple of years. As we go out, our eyes are adjusting again. How do we operate in this world of three-dimensional relationships? Now, as a profession, I get to work with leaders. And it's a lot of fun. And one of the most consistent questions we get is, how do I build relationships with my team? How do I strengthen the relationship with the people that I work with? Well, it's simple. Take more time to intentionally connect with your team. So whether it's walking around in your office, physically or even virtually, say, I'm going to go and travel to see people or have them come to my office, or I'm going to join meetings or calls with my team, my team to be able to see firsthand how they're doing, it's from those primary observations that we're able to best understand how to help and where the needs and, the, and the, the challenges are for our team. Now, whether it's a professional relationship or a, or, or, or a, a personal relationship, this need for connection sounds pretty logical. But, what, but what's happened is we got out of the habit of it. We got out of the habit of shaking hands and seeking to meet people and make relationships outside of our circles that were our safe circles. Yet by the time that we started to lose, to not take the intention to connect with people, we also stopped our ability to see clearly about issues and started making judgments. And it became increasingly more confusing about, well, how do I help? I'm just going to go back and retreat to my, my cave. 
So as we think about being intentional, when we, we make intentional connections, what we're doing is we're actually turning on our ability to see more clearly, see, see context, see paths forward, see solutions that can help us be able to mend communities and offer support where it's needed. Now the third element we talk about, and from intent we got time, intention, and the last one is curiosity. <clears throat> now I have the distinction of being an army brat. And what that means is I got to move around every three to four years, transplant, learn to meet new friends, connect in again, lots of schools. And my last couple years of high school, I had the opportunity <laughs> to live overseas. Now at first, I, I would, now I can say it's awesome, but at first I wasn't excited about it. I wasn't excited about moving from the United States outside of the, to, to another foreign country that I didn't know the language, didn't know the people, and not to mention the fact that it was my sophomore, junior, or my junior and senior, or sophomore, junior years of high school, so the prime time of my high school. And I remember flying over to this country and being reminded that, hey, you're a minority now. You're a guest in this country now, so act accordingly. Now, there was a pivotal moment that when I made a decision to say, I'm going to now look at this as an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to be more curious. And that's when it happened. It was a pivot. It was a shift that I made when I decided to be more curious about my experience of living in this country than being furious about not missing out what I was missing in the States. And from that curiosity, I began to meet people experience new foods, new, ex uh, new cultures, going outside the physical walls that I lived in and had the, some of the best two years of my, my life. And do you know what I discovered? As I was curious about the people that I lived around, I found that they were more like me than I ever thought. That we are more alike than we are different. I meet a teenage kid that's my age, we'd be on the soccer pitch, we'd play soccer, but guess what, they had the similar goals as me. They wanted to graduate, they wanted to get their parents off their back, they wanted to go to college, they wanted to get a job, get married, live in their, live in their country, make their country amazing, and be happy. As we are turn on our curiosity and turning off our judgment, we start to recognize the similarities that we have amongst ourselves and we became less about others and be more about being together. Another behavior I learned when in grad school, a whole semester talked about this, about the behavior of see and see again. And what that looks like is in the, in the behavior of, it's a curiosity behavior. So what they teach you to do is say, is if I see something, I look at it and I make my initial judgment, my initial biases and everything else, the lenses I'm looking through, but then I consciously make the choice to look at it again and to notice details and information or, or context or something that I didn't notice before. This is incredibly empower, uh, powerful curiosity behavior. As we start to see each other, we make a judgment. As we invite ourselves to see again, what else do we see? And for me, what this looks like is so I go to the grocery store and I can see the gal that's behind the check stand and she's no longer the checker, she's a grandma, a mom, working really hard at a job to pay, make ends meet for her family. The CNC began, a curiosity behavior looks like if I see somebody that's visibly different in their political leanings, I don't see them as an enemy or opposition or even somebody that's on the other side of the aisle but I notice them as a person who's doing the best that they can. I bet you they're scrapping out just like I am to do the best they can to live a happy life and to make their best of this world that we live in. It's those moments that when we turn off our judgments and our biases, which can be very hard, and we turn on our curiosity, that our eyes are opened and we're able to see paths forward. We're able to make new connections, and we're able to build new relationships, which are critical. Now, as I look out today, and we consider our collective nearsightedness that has been opposed upon us, or we choose to have, or whatever form of, of, of vision you have right ton tonight, I would ask you to consider your points of view, your, your, your vision, to get your eyes checked, to look at them and consider, how am I doing 
on this prescription? How am I doing on spending time, more time to get to the bottom of things, to understand both sides of a story before I make a judgment or I take an action? How am I doing to intentionally make connections to people I don't know? To reach across an opportunity to, to make a connection, to help somebody else out, because I never know if that's going to come back to help me out as well. Or am I curious? Am I embracing this curiosity that will help me understand and see the, the amazing threads that weave us together? Now, as I stand here on stage today, you see me. And you're making judgments and observations. And you notice I'm wearing glasses. Now, with my glasses, I can see all of you clearly. My hope is that as you consider your vision, that we can see the paths forward, we can extend hands of fellowship, we can open our hearts to opportunities for change and for learning, and by doing so, our vision becomes in focus and we can learn to see again. Thank you.